know yourself as the open, empty, luminous presence of awareness. Open because you say yes unconditionally and indiscriminately to all appearances of the mind, body, and world. Like empty space, you have no mechanism inherent within you that can resist any appearance. We don't have to make this the case, it is already the case. Empty, because although you, I, this aware presence is aware of thoughts, sensations, and perceptions. It is not made out of a thought, a sensation, or a perception. It is made out of pure knowing or awareness. and luminous because just like the sun relatively speaking that renders all objects seeable so you I this open empty presence renders all experience knowable In fact, we don't really see objects, relatively speaking, illumined by the sun. We just see reflections or modulations of the sun's light appearing as a multiplicity and diversity of color. In the same way, we don't really know the objects of the mind, body, and the world we just know our knowing of them. All we know, all that is known, is the knowing of experience. And you are that knowing. All that is ever known is a modulation of our own knowing presence, modulating itself in the, in the form of thinking, sensing, and perceiving, and seeming to become a mind, a body, and a world. But we never actually know a mind, a body, and a world as they are normally conceived. We just know our knowing of them. And this knowing, the substance of our experience, the only substance of our experience is our self. In other words, we know our self alone. Awareness knows nothing other than itself. Be knowingly this open, empty, luminous presence of awareness. We don't need to do anything special to make this happen. Above all, we don't have to manipulate the mind in any way whatsoever to be this presence of awareness. This presence of awareness, which is simply our self, what we refer to when we say I, is ever present.
check this in your own experience. Nothing that I am saying this evening, there is nothing that cannot be checked in your own direct experience right now. I bring no special knowledge to this meeting. I don't have a store of knowledge which I am disseminating. I'm just within the limits of language t trying to describe the current experience. Ask yourself, do I know anything other than now? Try to experience the not now. Try first to experience the past. It's easy to experience a thought about the past. But what about the actual past to which this thought refers? Try to experience that. Can you step into the past? Can you go one second into the past? Or one second into the future? Thought can go there. But what about you? Really try to go there to make sure that this is not just an interesting philosophical conversation, but that it, it is actually your experience that the past and the future are never experienced. And if the past and the future are never actually experienced, they are only thought about. And that thought about the past and the future is always now. If this past and future are never experienced, what does that say about time? Time is a movement between a non-existent past towards a non-existent future. It's a theory, a necessary and valid theory but a theory that doesn't refer to the reality of our experience. Nobody has ever or could ever experience time. When I say nobody, I mean yourself, awareness, the only one that knows or is aware. When I arrived off the plane from London to in Washington DC last weekend before coming here, the friend who picked me up asked me how the flight was and she said, how long did it take? And I experienced thought being cranked up like an old motor, a little resistant to get going. And for a moment, I could feel the cogs of thought almost moving, trying to work out how much time the flight had taken. Because in my experience, it had been now all the way. I had never left London. London had left me. I had never got onto an aeroplane. A flow of sensations and perceptions that thought abstracts and calls a body in an aeroplane flowed through me. And I never arrived in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. arrived in me, or at least the cluster of perceptions that thought calls Washington, D.C., arrived in me. In the same way, nobody 
ever walked into this room and nobody is sitting on a chair and nobody is listening to a talk. A colorful flow of sensations and perceptions appears in awareness. But awareness never goes anywhere or does anything. It is always here and now, not here a place and now a time. Here, this dimensionless, now this timeless presence of our own being. That is our experience, whether we recognize it or not. Now the mind may feel a little rebellious when it hears this. It may say, yes, 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 that's true. But there is an undeniable continuity to my experience. And this undeniable continuity would seem to be evidence of time. Where does this felt sense of continuity come from? All we know of the mind is the current thought or image. And thoughts and images are intermittent. The body is known through sensation. And all sensations are intermittent. All we know of the world is perception, that is, sights, sounds, tastes, textures, and smells. In fact, nobody has ever experienced a world as such, a world as it is normally conceived to be. We just know the current perception. And all perception is intermittent. So if the so-called mind, body, and world are intermittent, from where does this felt sense of continuity come from? It comes from the only thing, if we can call it a thing, that is truly continuous, or in fact not continuous, but ever-present now in our experience, and that is our own being, the presence of awareness. The presence of awareness is the only thing that is known to be ever-present. Now the mind knows nothing of awareness because the mind only knows apparent objects. So when the mind looks at experience to find what it is that accounts for continuity, it cannot see awareness. And so it manufactures a substance called time to account for the continuity of experience. In other words, continuity in time is what eternity looks like when viewed through the narrow slit of the mind. Permanence in space is what the infinite, unlimited nature of awareness looks like when viewed through the narrow slit of the mind. Continuity and permanence are pale reflections at the level of the mind of the true, eternal and infinite nature of awareness, that is, of our self. What else can we say about ourself from our actual experience? Which means, right now, what can we know for certain about ourself? Not what thought 
may tell us about ourselves, but what we actually know in this moment derived only from our experience of ourself. Ask yourself, can I, this open, empty, knowing presence, can I be agitated? Thought can be agitated. Sensations or the body can be agitated. The world can be agitated. But what about you, the one that knows the apparent mind, body, and world? Can you, this open, empty presence, be agitated? See in your experience right now that you are, and this of course is just an image, are like an open, empty space, such as the space of this room. Nothing that appears within this room can agitate it. We are all sitting peacefully now, but if we were to stand up and start dancing or fighting, would the space of this room become agitated? You are like that. You, I, the presence of awareness, are undisturbable, imperturbable. We don't need to become imperturbable, and this undisturbability of ourself is not dependent upon the condition of the mind. Right now, you awareness are utterly imperturbable and for this reason another name for ourself is peace. Peace is not a quality that ourself has, it is what ourself is. Not peace of mind. Minds are more or less agitated. This peace that passeth understanding that is not of the mind. It doesn't have to be sought. It is not hiding in the background of experience. This very awareness that is seeing, hearing, knowing, is pure peace itself, shining in all experience. However, apparently agitated that experience may be. Ask yourself, can I, this presence of awareness, ever lack something? Thoughts can say that something is missing. Feelings can say that something is missing. But what about you? Without referring to thought or feeling, is there the slightest motive in you to avoid the now and replace it with the not now? See that in yourself, this presence of awareness, there is not the slightest impulse or possibility to avoid the now. And what do we call this absolute absence of resistance to the now? The absolute absence of resisting what is and seeking what is not? What is the common name we give to this? It is called happiness. We all know that when we are happy, we are by definition not resisting the now and seeking in the past or the future. 
By happiness, of course, I do not mean a pleasant state of the mind or the body. I mean this absolute impossibility of our self ever to resist or seek, to resist what is and to seek what is not. So happiness, like peace, is just another name for our self. It is not a quality that our self has, it is what our self is. What else can we say for certain based on this current experience about ourself? When I was driving here, or being driven here, the day before yesterday, from the airport in San Francisco, I was looking in the wing mirror of the passenger seat, and I noticed the words inscribed at the bottom of the wing mirror. And they said, Objects in the mirror are closer than you think. A statement of pure non-duality. <laughs> Objects that appear in the mirror of consciousness are closer than we think. How close to a mirror are the objects that appear in it? Are there in fact two things? One, the objects that appear in the mirror, and two, the mirror? Or is it all just mirror? All we know of the apparent mind is the experience of thinking. And thinking is just a modulation of yourself, a modulation of knowing or awareness. All we know of the apparent body is the experience of sensing. And sensing is a modulation of yourself, awareness. All we know of the apparent world is the experience of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting and smelling. These are all modulations of knowing, modulations of our self. In other words, we never truly know a mind or a body or a world. These labels are just abstractions that thought superimposes on the intimacy of our experience. From the point of view of experience, which is the only real point of view, experience is much closer much more intimate, so close as to not admit the possibility of two things, one, myself, awareness, and two, the object that I know. Even that is an abstraction. It may be a useful stepping stone, a halfway understanding to conceive of thoughts, sensations, and perceptions arising in awareness. But nothing arises in awareness. The only substance of all experience, the only substance of thinking, sensing, and perceiving is already awareness. What do we call this absolute absence of two things? a subject that knows, and an object that is known. Take now the experience of hearing. Go to the sound of the 
air conditioning. Forget about the labels sound and air conditioning. Our only knowledge of the apparent air conditioning is the experience of hearing. How close does hearing take place to you? Five meters away? Ten meters away? Refer only to your experience, not to what thought tells you about sound. Where is hearing? Is it close? Intimate? And in the experience of hearing, can you find two parts? One part that hears, and another part that is heard? Or is it just one seamless, intimate substance called my self? And what about this room? Thought says, I, the inside self in here, sees the room, the outside world, out there. But what does experience say? All we know of the apparent room is the experience of seeing. Remove seeing and the room vanishes. In other words, we don't know a room. We just know the experience of seeing. Does seeing take place five, ten, fifteen meters away from yourself? Or is seeing utterly intimate? And can you find two parts to the experience of seeing? One part that sees and another part that is seen? Or is it just one seamless, intimate substance? And what is the name, the common name, we give to the absolute intimacy of all experience? It is called love. Love is the most familiar experience that we all know. The collapse or dissolution of the sense of a self in here and an object, other, or world out there. The collapse of this sense of separateness, distance, otherness, not me-ness is what we call love. Love is just another name for non-duality. If we call it non-duality, there's just a few thousand of us in the world that are interested in it. But if we call it love, or peace, or happiness, then all seven billion of us are interested in it. So why is it if love, peace, happiness are the natural condition of all experience, the substance out of which all experience is made, how is it that it seems not to be experienced? It is because of a single thought that rises in awareness, made only of awareness, which imagines that awareness shares the limits of the thoughts, feelings, and sensations that appear within it. It is like imagining that a mirror shares the limits of the objects that appear in it. With that thought alone, the ever-present, unlimited awareness, which is what we are, seems, seems to acquire or take on 
the apparent limits of the body and the mind. Just as the screen seems to take on the limits of an image when a film begins. As a result of this imaginary collapse or contraction of our self, unlimited, eternal awareness into a body and a mind, these qualities of love, peace and happiness are seemingly veiled. And it is for this reason that the self, the separate self that thought imagines us to be, is always, by definition, on a search in the imaginary outside world for the apparently lost love, peace and happiness. However, this imaginary inside self cannot, by definition, find the love that it seeks because its very presence, its apparent presence, is the veiling of that love. All the separate self seeks is love. In fact, the separate self is not an entity that searches. It is the activity of resisting the now and seeking the not now. All this seeking ever wants is love. But love is the dissolution of this seeking, the dissolution of this imaginary self. In other words, the separate self that seeks love is like a moth that seeks a flame. The flame is all the moth wants, but it is the only thing it cannot have. Because as the moth touches the flame, it dies. That is its way of knowing the flame. It becomes the flame as it touches it. That is the separate self's way of finding love, by dying in it. The death or dissolution of the separate self is the experience of love. So simply be knowingly this open, empty, luminous presence of awareness whose nature, whose inherent nature is love, peace and happiness. Not a love, peace and happiness that is in the background of experience that has to be sought but that is shining in full view at the heart of all experience. In fact, experience is made out of this substance called peace or happiness. <coughs> 